In a December 15, 1956 letter, Tolkien wrote, I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat. Though it contains, and in a legend may contain more clearly and movingly, some samples or glimpses of final victory. This theme of the long defeat rings clearly throughout Tolkien's works. We see it in Frodo's decline at the end of Lord of the Rings. We see it in the exodus of the elves from Middle-earth at the end of the Third Age. We see it in Tolkien's pessimistic attitude towards the idea of a sequel to Lord of the Rings, contending that the Fourth Age would be so dark that it would be unfit to write about. It would seem that Tolkien certainly was no optimist, though the idea of the long defeat does not mean that one should be entirely without hope either. What did Tolkien mean by this idea of the long defeat? Join us as we explore this topic with special guest, author Connor Sweeney. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, episode 202. The Long Defeat. Took you a while to get that one out there. Yeah, I haven't decided on the exact title for this episode as we're recording right now. So, uh, huh. okay. yeah, but but that's basically what we're talking about. That's huh. it's close enough. Close for what enough. We here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love how profesh we are. Yes, always, always, always professional. The profeshest of the profesh. As I'm uh, as I'm scrambling to get the intro music back on to this right even before that. So, uh, uh, we're just we're winning. Winning. Killing it. Well, as they say. You know. It's it's not about perfection with us. No. Nope. It's about rolling with it. It's about taking what life throws at you mm-hmm. and making lemonade. Always. N- yeah. Lemonade. Mi- mix- or limeade. And Sometimes mi- I mi- prefer limeade. And mixing metaphors. Yeah. yeah that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Greta, how are you? Hey, I'm I'm good. Did you have a good vacation? I had an amazing vacation. Good. Yeah. It's just what I needed. Great. Went by too fast, as vacations tend to do. Yeah. But it was lovely while it lasted. How about you? Did you have a good vacation? I did. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Yeah. So, um... We did vacation together, by the way. We did. (laughs) So, (laughs) um... But yeah, it's good to be back. It's good to be uh, setting out on another uh, little journey through some more of Tolkiendom. We're going to kick things off for the month of August 2020 with a uh, an interview I actually recorded um, about a month ago with uh, Connor Sweeney, who has written a book called Abiding the Long Defeat, How to Evangelize Like a Hobbit in a Dis- Disenchanted Age. It's a really good book. I had a great interview with Connor. Um, he's very knowledgeable, very uh, lots of uh, lots of philo- philosophical training, like kind of the hardcore philosophical training. Oh, right? okay. So, uh, so buckle you know, your seatbelts, people. Buckle your seatbelts. He he does take it easy on all us on all us lay people out there <laughs> when it comes to these things. But uh, but nevertheless, he has a lot of really interesting stuff to say, especially through that lens of the idea of the long defeat. Uh, before we get to that. Please support us. Please support the Tolkien Road podcast. We want to give a shout out to our newest patron. Uh, I, th- I'm going to try my best on this name. I'm going to give it actually two two goes. It's either Vite in or Vite in. And I apologize that I don't know the exact pronunciation. I normally try beforehand to figure out the right way to say it, but um, uh, I failed in that today. So okay. cue cue the uh, common unprofessionalism. Exactly. But uh, but please do let me know what the correct way to pronounce your name is and uh, and, and thank you and and I will very much I will give it another mention on the next episode and thank you thank you for becoming a patron absolutely all right uh, also special shout out to our recently boosted patrons these are people who are already patrons but decided to boost their support uh, that would go to Jonathan D and to Monique S Ooh, so sweet thank thanks you. guys thank you both very much for yeah. that. You can become a patron too. Head on over to patreon.com slash Tolkien Road to find out the deets. Uh, we're currently doing a Patreon overhaul that you're going to love. So you'll want to head on over there and check it all out. Plenty more to say about that in the future, but uh, we're, we're in the process of beginning a little bit of an overhaul over there. Uh, and also, you, if you don't want to contribute on a monthly basis, you can use Tip Jar. 
So that's something you can go to the Tolkien Road website and you look look for that little leave a tip button. Uh, it should be on just about every page, especially the pages for uh, the various episodes, and you can leave us a tip like that. Another way to support us is to rate and review us on iTunes. Please leave us a five-star rating and say something nice about us. And uh, then please subscribe to our feed as well. So Yeah, just do all the things. And if you want to correspond, we'd love to hear from you. Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. You can go to our website uh, through Facebook, through Twitter. All of those ways are good ways to correspond with us. Word. Yeah, so like I said, on this episode, Greta, I interviewed mm-hmm. Connor Sweeney, author of the book Abiding the Long Defeat. Mm-hmm. And we talked a good bit about all kinds of Tolkienian topics, including mythology, enchantment, and modernity. Connor really has a lot of great stuff to say about how Tolkien's outlook can help us find hope and spiritual light in an age that seems to be entrenched in darkness and despair. Oh. So, uh, I don't know about about you, but I've been feeling kind of a little extra dose of the darkness and despair, you know, for these last few months, you know? Yeah. Not, Not that I'm sunken in despair myself, but... Um, there seems to be much more dark it's, than light. It's it's coming at it's coming at us all a little harder these yeah, days. Yeah, agreed. You know? mm-hmm. Something's going on in the world, and we yeah. all need a little more of a dose of Tolkien. So, agreed. You need to do yourself a favor and listen to this episode for that very reason, because Connor has some really wonderful things to say in that department. Um, most of all, this interview it's about a str- it's about that strange Tolkienian concept of the long defeat. I know some people have written to me in the past saying, Hey, you need to do an episode on the long defeat and what exactly Tolkien means by that. Well, this episode is that episode because Connor has written a whole book about that very topic. So, um, and what's really interesting is that the long defeat, this idea, this Tolkienian idea of the long defeat really points to a deep and abiding hope. Right. And it's that strange thing that happens in Tolkien's and that Tolkien has the way of doing right where he Mm -hmm. can go deep into the darkness and find that glimmer of hope, mm-hmm. which really like fills you, you know, with a powerful hope. So, and that's uh, somewhat connected to the you, you catastrophe. You catastrophe. That's right. You catastrophic moment. That's right. Yep. You got it. All right. Awesome. Well, a couple of quick notes on Tolkien news. So, um, this one I thought was really interesting. So, and and I don't know how I missed this because uh, it seems to have come out last year, but. There's apparently a new book of Tolkien's writings that's coming out at some point in uh, 2021. It's uh, it's going to be called The Nature of Middle-Earth, apparently. Um, and so this is via the OneRing.net. I'll post a link to it in our show notes. But uh, here's the description that uh, is associated with what I found. The first ever publication of J.R.R. Tolkien's final writings on Middle-earth, covering a wide range of subjects, and the perfect next read for those who have enjoyed unfinished tales and the history of Middle-earth series and are hungry for more. The nature of Middle-earth will comprise numerous ta- late, circa 1959-73, to 73, and previously unpublished writings by J.R.R. Tolkien on the nature of Middle-earth in both chief senses of that word, both metaphysical and natural historical. For Tolkien fans, readers, and scholars interested in learning more about Tolkien's own views on Middle-earth, it will appeal in particular to those readers who enjoyed unfinished tales in some of the later volumes of the history of Middle-earth. Indeed, many of the texts to be included are closely associated with materials published in these place, in those places and were sent to uh, Hostetter. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, oh, it's the Tol- it's, uh, Bennett, it's the person who edited this book, the Tolkien expert, so we'll, maybe we'll try to get them on the show. Uh, edited specifically in photocopy by Christopher Tolkien for potential publication. Much as Unfinished Tales forms an unofficial 13th volume of the history of Middle-earth, this new book will sit very nicely alongside as an unofficial 14th volume. Of particular note, given the impending Amazon series, are several texts dealing the, detailing the lands, flora, and fauna of Numenor and the lives of Numenorians. So mm. that's kind of cool. That's very cool. Um, yeah. Sounds basically, you know, another volume. It's not being called this, but another volume essentially in the history of Middle Earth, giving us just more uh, info on what Middle Earth is. And that particular title is very, uh, is very tantalizing the nature of Middle Earth. Absolutely. So sounds lovely. Yeah. So pretty exciting stuff. We'll have to keep our eyes and uh, ears to the ground for that one. And then um, not a whole lot of, you know, not a whole lot of big deal kind of news with Latron Prime these days. Uh, there's a lot of rumors going around. So I've been seeing rumors, what I take to be rumors of filming to resume in September uh, after closing down, obviously, for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic back in March. And then, you know, maybe things are looking good for a possible release sometime in, sometime in 2021, at least for, you know, okay. maybe a few episodes. Okay. Uh, and that Elrond, Sauron, and Galadriel are confirmed for the show. 
So that's also a rumor. Well, maybe, maybe not. I, I just wasn't able to source it super as, as much as I would have wanted to to oh, say that okay. it's it's any more than a rumor at this point. But gotcha. you know, kind of all we got is some rumors right now. So yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah. The you know, I'll mention this one. The other rumor that I'm kind of bummed out about, and I hope it's not true, is that Tom Shippey is no longer a part of the production, and that's that's disconcerting to me because to me he was the lifeline between being true to Tolkien's own vision and the show itself. So if that is true, that he's no longer part of the show, I really hope that they found somebody else who can, who can carry that mantle successfully. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I haven't seen that confirmed as an official thing. So I don't know. Uh, I've just seen like posts, I think uh, about it from various websites. So don't, again, don't take that as gospel, but it's just simply a rumor I saw out there. Um, and I hope it's not true. I hope that Tom Shippey is still part of it because I feel like he is key to the success of the show or at least somebody with his particular background and skill set. Right, right. So, and his knowledge as far as Tolkien and his absolutely, works go. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully we're going to have some like big announcements, uh, you know, in the next few months with uh, Latron Prime. But you know that as soon as we do, you know, we'll be talking about it over here at the Tolkien Road. Yes, so uh, make sure you're subscribed and uh, and you know, listening. So yes, both and both and yeah. All right. Stick around for the end of the, to the end of the episode for correspondence. Um, Greta, you ready to yeah. listen to my interview with Connor Sweeney? I can't wait. Any final thoughts before we dive in? No, I'm I, this whole, this idea and this whole Tolkien concept of the long defeat is one that I find very intriguing Yeah, because it, at first glance, it seems very kind of depressing. Yeah. Right. But, um, but we know it's not right. So I'm excited to learn more. Cool. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do it. All right. Enjoy the interview guys. Our guest on today's episode is Connor Sweeney. He is the author of Sacramental Presence after Heidegger, Onto Theology, Sacraments, and the Mother's Smile, as well as Abiding the Long Defeat, How to Evangelize Like a Hobbit in a Disenchanted Age and The Politics of Conjugal Love, A Baptismal and Trinitarian Approach to Headship and Submission. In addition to publishing three books, Sweeney also co-edited God and Eros, The Ethos of the Nuptial Mystery, edited with Colin Patterson. Sweeney's expertise includes sacramental theology, theological anthropology, systematic theology, and evangelization. His interests also include the relationship between culture and Christianity, and conceptualizing the faith in baptismal terms. Sweeney and his wife are originally from Vancouver, British Columbia. Together, they are the proud parents of five children. Connor, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So, Connor, tell us a little bit more about yourself. So we had a good bit of it from the bio there, but uh, what else should we know about Connor Sweeney? Um, well, it's not the most um, exciting, exciting life story, but I won't be writing an autobiography anytime soon, at least yet. Um, so, yeah, I'm Canadian. I married a Canadian... Uh, Canadian girl and we moved to um, Australia first. I actually studied at the institute where I would end up teaching. Uh, I did my master's there and then after that I went to Rome to the JP2 Institute in Rome, did my doctorate and then back to Australia and we've been here for our current stint here has been about eight years. Um, We raised a few of our kids here Um, so it's been a there's certainly been a been an Australian uh, connection in in our lives. Um, it's been a good it's been a good run. Um, we certainly enjoyed our enjoyed our time here. All right. Um, aside from that, yeah, I think that covers it with the academic. I don't want to get too too deep into Heidegger in, in, in this context. Um, so probably just let that be. But but yeah, I'm a bit of a when it comes to my academic background, a bit bit of a um, jack of all trades really i like to to dabble in a a number of different things um so i certainly wouldn't say i've got systematic expertise about anything but hopefully there's enough bits and pieces and i try to i try to bring things together as much as i can um that's kind of the way i way i approach my my academic work yeah well going through your book abiding the long defeat um i definitely picked up on that you kind of you seem to um bring from a lot of different sources uh you know and, and really synthesize your philosophical training into something that's pretty readable, you know, for, for a layperson such as myself. Um, someone who doesn't yeah, have well, a lot that, of uh, training. That's encouraging. That's encouraging to hear. Cause that was really the, the aim. And, you know, you always sort of, 
Um, you're, you're always a bit nervous doing things like that because there are some pretty weighty, heavy ideas. And when you're trying to synthesize, you know, 2000 years of history, there's going to be a lot that you have to leave out, obviously. So you're, you're always worried that you're putting the emphasis on the right, the wrong thing. So it can be a bit complex, but hopefully it, it sort of came together in that text. Yeah, well, I think it did. Um, so, to, um, Connor, tell us, how did you first discover Tolkien? Um, really, Tolkien emerged for me growing up. Um, read The Lord of the Rings multiple times growing up. And then from that, I sort of started dipping into some of his other works. Not not extensively. I wouldn't call myself a, a Tolkien expert or I haven't, certainly haven't read every single thing he's written. But, you know, The Silmarillion, Lord of the Rings, those were sort of the you know, they fire the imagination, if you will, and they sort of had a lasting, lasting impact on me. So it's really reading him growing up that is the place that I've, I've most become acquainted with Tolkien. Well, just the fact that you threw the Silmarillion into that bunch says that you have read a lot more Tolkien than, uh, than most, <laughs> even most Tolkien fans have. So that's yeah, good. Yeah, I pushed a little bit, a little bit into that, in, into that territory, but certainly Lord of the Rings is sort of the, the one that I, I read multiple times and obviously the Hobbit, I should, I should mention the Hobbit. Mm-hmm. I just actually read in the last couple of years, I've read the Hobbit and the whole of the Lord of the Rings with my, with my two oldest. Um, so hopefully they're, they're getting into it as well. That's interesting. How did how did that experience go for your for your um, children of reading Lord of the Rings? Yeah, it was them? good actually. I mean, The Hobbit. I mean, that's a little more. I mean, that's more deliberately a, a children's work, obviously. So they were, you know, they were fairly young when they read it. The youngest must have been seven, and the oldest nine or something. And then, sort of a couple a year later, maybe Lord of the Rings. So I was actually surprised that they, you know, they really took it in. Um, so it ended up being a good experience. Was that was that like an actual read aloud with them, or was it like we all? Yeah, you know, no, I would read them a chapter every night before bed, and yeah, they, they seemed to like that. Wow, that's that's better than my kids have responded to the uh, to the attempted read aloud of Lord of the Rings. I'll well, say I was that. just surprised at how relatively quickly we we made it through the whole book. Yeah, it's um, and that's that's something that's always struck me about Lord of the Rings is how you know it's a pretty substan- substantially. It's a long piece of piece of work, mm-hmm. and yet it reads like it's you know you can sit down and almost read it in a week. I mean, you, you sort of get engrossed, and it doesn't feel like you're. It's a very long book. Once you get going, it's hard to put down. That's for sure. Absolutely. Um, so, what would you say is your favorite work by Tolkien? Um, I would say Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, which is part of the reason why I sort of chose it as the, the background trope of this this current book. Um, so yeah, there's. There's just so much to work with within that within that articulation of Middle Earth and that whole drama of the Hobbits and the Ring and all the rest of it. So it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's had quite a profound effect on me. Yeah, and and next that's something I wanted to ask you about definitely with regard to the book. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about the I you know um, the the trope right that you mentioned of you know here is this book that you wrote that is a very real world philosophical and theological book. Um, and so I'm interested in why you decided ultimately to use Tolkien's fantasy world as a is this kind of like motif or extended metaphor uh, throughout the book. Right. Yeah, it wasn't the first thing that came to mind. It wasn't the first motivation. I mean, you really have to dig into a little bit of the history and a lot of the material of the, of the book to get to it. So the book sort of comes out of a out of a course I taught at the institute here in Melbourne. Um, originally titled the new evangelization and postmodern culture. Basically the goal was, well, how do we understand what the task of evangelization looks like today within our current secular environment or postmodern environment? So the whole point of the, of the course was basically doing historical work, figuring out sort of the genealogy of ideas and development of ideas to understand sort of the present historical configuration that we find ourselves in and what it might mean to evangelize in that setting. So we looked at thinkers like Nietzsche and Heidegger and Descartes and all of the sort of the Kant and all the big names sort of in the history of the the Western tradition. Um, And then I ended up doing a a somewhat more popular level presentation of that course, um, actually a trip in in New Zealand. So I did at that level and I thought to myself, well, if it's, if it's going to be, if I'm going to present it to, a more general audience, I need to sort of be a little bit more aware of how I communicate these, these heavy ideas. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, what's a, what's a way in? And really it's sort of at that point, you know, thinking about evangelization and how that's to be performed in a very difficult context, I thought, well, there's probably something in this notion of the, the hobbits, these plain, simple folk that somehow managed to accomplish this, this 
earth-shattering, momentous deed, not on the basis of their great learning or knowledge, but on sort of the basis of their, their character, their formation, the, 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 somehow their journey and the fellowship of faith in which they find themselves in, somehow that becomes ingredient to the successful completion of their task. So th it's at that point that I started to incorporate Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings and all the motifs therein to communicate sort of, you know, these difficult historical and philosophical ideas, developmental ideas, and ultimately to apply it to um, the question of evangelization. Gotcha. So, well, quick question, quick side note on that. Um, so while you were in New Zealand, did you did you visit the uh, the Shire? <laughs> I didn't. It was more of a kind of a whirlwind trip. I didn't want to be away from from the family too long. No doubt I it was a few years ago, but no doubt I would have had a, a couple at least in diapers. So I didn't want to leave my wife uh, alone for too long. But I, you know, in hindsight, I regret it because obviously that uh, that window is sort of closing at this point. But hopefully one day I'll make it back and have a look. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it uh, it would certainly be more of a pilgrimage if you got back. <laughs> oh, that's got back right. There yeah. In the future, it would be so. very meaningful at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, so you know, you titled this book "The Long Defeat" um, or "Abiding the Long Defeat." Um, I, I introduced the concept of the long defeat a little bit uh, at the beginning of uh, this interview, but what can you like? What can you tell us about Tolkien's idea of the long defeat? Can you kind of unpack that for us? Because it's a very, it's a very, it feels like a very nuanced idea. Um, it's not total mm -hmm. pessimism, but it can maybe seem yeah. like it. Yeah. That's right. No, I mean, the, the pessimism thing, first and foremost, it rings true for me. I mean, I think I've got that, that personality type. So I think I, you mentioned resonate. that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But I mean, if we look at, you know, and I, and I was working with, I know, I know at least two references to this notion of long defeat. There's one in the text of the Lord of the Rings, I believe, somewhere near the end. Um, but then there's also that reference in um, one of his letters. And that was the quote that you, that you read earlier. Mm -hmm. And so he, he begins by saying he's a Catholic, and therefore it's on the basis of that that he sort of has this understanding of history as a defeat. Now, for me, that's a, that's a pretty theological statement that sort of first and foremost takes us into the sort of logic of, of Christian faith. Yeah, he really— in the, world, it, he, he really in the world is otherwise heading for decay. He really ties that. I mean, he says, because I am, <laughs> I'm a Christian and a Catholic, this is yeah. what I expect. You know, and it's like, oh, that's right. exactly. okay. So it's not going to be, I mean, so you can see him undermining here the sort of liberal notion of this, of this arc towards, you know, endless progress, utopia, some kind of human per per perfection in this world. So he's saying, well, actually, no, a Christian understanding of the world actually means we're heading for something a lot darker and a lot more pessimistic. Um, and so I think there's really a, a Christian cosmology, a Christian eschatology that's going on in his understanding of, of history as a long defeat. And like I say, I think it's a, it's an undermining of, of modern notions of, of history heading, heading towards um, project from progress rather. So I think what you see in the very, in the whole world of middle earth is this, you know, it's very much animated by this idea of defeat. Mm -hmm. So we begin with this sort of, you know, it's a very enchanted world and it sort of remains an enchanted world throughout, but there's this sort of, there's this decay written into it. So by the time we get to the end of the Lord of the Rings, it's not really the same world. There's a sort of receding of the, of the sort of um, spiritual or spirit animated sort of understandings. The elves, the elves diminish and head into the West and everybody sort of leaves and Middle Earth is kind of in a way demythologized or secularized compared to what it was before. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole notion within the Lord of the Rings of, of I think Tolkien uses the phrase sorrowful joy. Mm -hmm. So in the end they triumph, but somehow it's not sort of like, you know, party time. It's more sort of this nostalgic, um, there's this sort of everything is sort of tinged with a kind of a kind of sorrow that yes we save the world but it's not quite the same world that was before we're not the same people and there's a real sorrow and sort of brokenness even as you know the the hobbits head back to the shire and start to pick up pieces as it were yeah. so there's a real kind of melancholy melancholy about it and in a way I mean we see this in 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 the Christian life I mean. First and foremost, we believe that ultimately history is, the, is about the victory of, of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ comes and saves us from, from sin, from death, from, from decay. And yet, you know, by baptism, even if we're called into that divine life, that eternal communion, there's still, we still have to live the arc of this life, which is birth, life, decay, suffering, and death. And there's a lot of sorrow that comes, 
that comes with that. So even amidst ultimate victory, being saved by Jesus Christ, being called into divine communion, there is still this sort of sadness and suffering that, that accompanies human life. And we're sort of told by the scriptures in the New Testament to expect that you know, things will actually get a lot worse, in a sense, before they get ultimately better. So I think all of these ideas are sort of percolating when you, when you think of the way that Tolkien uses this notion of long defeat. And I think long defeat as a phrase is, is quite, quite evocative. I think it yes, really it is. has power, power to it, which is partly why I chose it. And I think it's all very obviously very relevant to our own historical configuration here in the secular West. And, and that's another reason. I mean, it does seem like we're in some kind of a, of a cycle of long defeat. And I think in, in that sense, it's apt as well. Yeah, it just hearing you hearing you kind of unpack that um, it just strikes me how important this idea, even though he doesn't use it a lot in uh, in his writings, the, the specific words of the long defeat. I mean, there are a couple instances yeah. like you mentioned, but it really is um, it's all over the place. You know, it's yeah. it, it's truly yeah. all over the place, and especially in the Lord of the Rings, e- even in the Silmarillion. Um, Maybe you don't see it as much in The Hobbit. I'm sure you could if you looked really hard. But uh, but even there, you know, they. I mean, with The Hobbit, they they achieve their ultimate goal, but uh, Thorin dies and Feely and Keeley die. Yeah, right. <laughs> so right. so there's definitely I mean, a lot of. Is, another way to put it is history is is inherently tragic. Mm. Um, and again, even the good things are somehow laced with with sorrow and sort of a. You know, in the midst of it, you sort of feel like, well, what's the what's the ultimate point? So I won this battle, I had this, I achieved this quest, and yet, you know, life goes on. You know, the hobbits return to the Shire, and they're not heroes in the Shire. No one knows what they've even done. They've saved the world, yeah. and yet, you know, we've got to come back and sort of get dug into, you know, the petty politics of, of, of village life and all the rest of it. Yeah. Well, um, and you know, as you were talking about this, I I I thought of like. Um that moment of that, like, which may be the mo- the moment of the most, po- the most poignant moment in the entire book, Lord of the, in, in, in all of Lord of the Rings is when Sam wakes up and Gandalf is there. And he thought, you know, he, he had assumed Gandalf had been dead for, you know, for a while now. Right. And Gandalf yeah, is right. there and he, and he basically said, is everything sad going to come untrue? Right. Um, yeah. And it's this moment of incredible, like, pi- like piercing joy. And, yeah. um, and just for a moment, you kind of feel like maybe, maybe it is right. Maybe, maybe actually everything yeah, is. Yeah. And, yeah. um, but, but it never, it never seems to, um, you know, but, but from there we kind of, as you mentioned, we get back, go back to the Shire and Frodo is never the same. Frodo kind of just, just in pain and, um, and never really, never recovers from his wounds. Yeah, you know, right. um, if, even on yeah. a spiritual and psychological level, he's seen, he's just very wounded right. for the rest of yeah. his life. Yeah, and that's a, I mean, that's a, a pretty apt image for, you know, what happens to a lot of us in life. I mean, life can throw a hell of a lot of things at us that, that leave us wounded. And yes, if we talk about, about redemption and grace, there is a sense in which the fullness of that reality is deferred until, you know, until we die. So yeah. this life can be very deeply, be deeply plagued by all kinds of things. Yeah. Wow. It's such a without getting too depressing. Of course. <laughs> well, it's it just I think it reflects this tension, right? You know, um, the, the tension between it, it as uh, as Christians, we we hold this um, fundamental view, um, a fundamental belief that Christ is risen, right? Christ is risen from the dead, and it, and and belief in it as historical fact, right? Hmm. Uh, and and is transcendent. Um, historical fact as well, right? That it applies to all of history and all of the cosmos, and um, and so, but even even still, like we we hold it as a belief and as a hope that we will that we are partaking in it now and will partake in it in a full way in in, in, in some future sense. Yeah. Um, but even now, we we find ourselves decaying and you know struggle and the normal struggles of life still apply. You know, as you were kind of saying earlier. So yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. Is realizing that tension. So, <laughs> mm. um, well, why? So, and I think we're coming maybe kind of round back about to the book. Why did you decide to re- decide to write a book about this topic? And I know you covered a little bit of this when we talked about the motif of um, of Tolkien's fantasy world for this. But but your but the book isn't really about Tolkien's fantasy world. It's about our world. And so, why did you decide to write right. a book about this topic? 
Well, I mean, the book comes out of that course I taught. It comes out of the, you know, this question of, you know, how do you evangelize in a secular, disenchanted, disenchanted age? Can, um, can we pause? So let's pause on that. And I didn't, this wasn't what was on my list of questions, but, but it strikes me yeah. because it, as you and I talked about before we began the interview, Connor, um, a, a good portion of, of our audience and, and of Tolkien fandom uh, are not Christian um, and, um, and, and so for them, evangelism might even seem like a strange word or even a bad word. Right. Um, can, can you, can you help us understand like what, what we mean by evangelism, when we, especially when we speak about it as, as Christians and maybe that's part of what yeah, you're trying well, to discover. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in a very, in a very basic sense, we think of, you know, the closing of the gospels and the great commission where Christ commissions the disciples to go out and proclaim claim the gospel to all people. So that sort of, that, that remains a constant within the Christian understanding of, uh, of, of the heart of its mission. Um, and that's basically a, an affirmation of the fact that Christians believe that, you know, Christ's death and resurrection is, is offering us of eternal life. That's good news. That is a way of salvation. That is a way we, we survive and escape ultimately the long defeat, if you will. And so that's something that's worth sharing with other people. So sharing that good news um, is sort of the fundamental sort of outward moving aspect of Christianity. So first of all, for, for Christians, faith and grace are a gift that give, make us new creations that elevate us into participation in God. And this is, you know, from creation, this is what we've been created for. And so ultimately, this is something that everybody has been created for. And therein lies this, this mission aspect, this evangelical aspect of, of Christian faith. So that was, that was, you know, sort of uppermost in, in my mind, writing this book and again, flowing out of the, you know, the goal of this, this course that I taught at the Institute. And so all I wanted to do with the book really was to apply that more generally to a, to a broader audience, basically. Um, so that was the goal. So, and obviously, you know, once you've, you know, once you've taught a course, you know, you can get second life out of it by writing a book. So <laughs> that, that's always a bonus as well from an academic point of view. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so, um, uh, lost my spot here. Okay, here we go. Um, so let's, let's actually shift to the, uh, to the text of the book and, and pick out some high points. There, there's, this is a great book. I mean, there's so much good stuff in this, uh, in this book and it really deals, you know, with, I think where we find ourselves in the modern world is modern people, Catholic, Christian, none of the above, right? Like where we find ourselves in this world. And, and I, I very much resonated with so much of it and the sense of how I feel on a daily basis about the world I live in. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and on, on a, on a way that I think anybody could, could sympathize with. Um, one of the things that's crossed my mind, you know, on, um, on a number of occasions is just this idea of like how, um, small the world now feels compared to even when I was a child, right? Like I used to right. think of like Europe as this place or Australia, or, like place I'll never go, or it'd be, you know, it's like yeah, this huge right. journey to go there. And now it's just like, you know, no big whoop, just go over to one of these places. You can go anywhere yeah. in the world yeah. and no big, no big deal. Or you can just at least, talk at to least somebody in Australia them. through zoom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it really is a, a, I could think Marshall McLuhan used the term global village and that was sort of, I mean, that might have even been back before the internet. It must have been. Um, so, you know, the internet and and all kinds of other technologies have certainly, yes, made the world a very small place. Yeah, and um, but there's a there's kind of a um, a tiredness that seems to come with that too, or a um, mm. or just kind of di the words you really the word that's a powerful word I think that you use is this disenchantment. Um, yeah, and right. and so on that. On that note, let me. I'm going to read the first paragraph of uh, of your chapter one here, where which is called "The World okay. Has Changed." Yeah. Um, so you start with a quote from "The Return of the King." It is sad that we should meet thus only at the ending. The world has changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. I do not think we shall meet again. And then you say this poignant, spine tingling description sets the scene for what we can describe as the postmodern condition of our own world. In the context of Tolkien's Middle Earth, Treebeard at the end utters these words, evoking a world that is slowly but surely losing what we, what we might call its mystical or enchanted character. 
At the end of The Lord of the Rings, Middle-earth enters the Fourth Age, a time marked by the waning of an explicitly supernatural reality, a kind of dying of the light in a world originally animated by spirits, angelic powers, magic, etc. Non-human beings, such as elves, dwarves, and ents, either decrease in power or leave Middle-earth altogether. This is embodied in Lady Gladriel's statement, I will diminish and go into the West. The elves leave the shores of Middle-earth never to return. Middle-earth now belongs to men and men alone. The world has changed. So is, is, you know, Tolkien fans, we all, you know, are, are kind of familiar with what you say here um, on some level. But how does this same spirit of disenchantment apply to our own, our, the time in which we live? Mm, yeah. Yeah, and that's sort of the, like I said before, I mean, I see, I mean, I think Tolkien was writing, you know, he constructed Middle Earth with a lot of these sort of ideas going through his own head about you know what are the situation of our world today and i think that's that's just become more relevant as we you know we fast forward you know several decades since tolkien's death um so this notion of disenchantment and, and you, know, you really have to sort of understand what what comes first um so you know obviously um we've got you know pre-christian understanding i mean in some in some sense the most real is the spiritual, the angelic, the metaphysical, whatever word you want to use for that. And somehow the very fiber of being is sort of animated by this, this living presence of something simply beyond the visible. So this notion that reality has, has layers, there's something more, even if we don't know what that is, even if you know we, 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 we might think that at the end of the day, this life is all there is and we die and we have no idea what comes next. There is still this imaginative element about reality. And so all of humanity is learning for, in some sense, you could say the infinite and the eternal as the, the answer to this experience of, of temporal, you know, this, this meaning, we feel this meaning pressing down on us. We don't know what it means. We don't know if there's something after uh, when we die, but we feel like somehow we are created for something more. Then Christianity emerges on the world scene and offers us this, this glimpse of this um, infinite and eternal love that saves and redeems us and offers us new life in, in God himself. And so this becomes a, you know, the early Christians understood this as a fulfillment of the deep in, deepest longings and the aspirations of, of, say, the Greek philosophers in this movement towards logos. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that changes the, the, the whole fabric of human history, really, and truly. And someone like Nietzsche understood that when he reacted so strongly against it. He understood that, you know, the Christian understanding of reality, you know, truly sort of conquered the world and changed people's fundamental perception of, of being. So now there is this eternal and infinite hope. By baptism, you're immersed in Christ's death and resurrection. And there actually is something beyond, you know, suffering and death. And then we sort of, you know, fast forward through to the Enlightenment, to modernity, and there's this sort of revaluing of that whole whole system. There's this notion that somehow, you know, the notion of God becomes oppressive. What had been Christian hope now becomes sort of translated into this desire and or this understanding of, of the capacities of reason to to know reality. So everything is sort of put within what Charles Taylor's call Charles Taylor calls an imminent frame. So we have this sort of bracketing out of real transcendence and real um, something beyond the world. So we sort of close ourselves back in. We still have this religious impulse, but now the difference is we sort of map it out horizontally rather than vertically. So real transcendence is something that no one really believes in anymore. We don't believe in spirit. We believe in matter. We believe in science, et cetera, et cetera. So really we're now at a point where we sort of hollowed out meaning to sim simply become something that is purely imminent. And hmm. so transcendence has been, has been cut out of, out of the mix. Um, and so when you, when you look at sort of our basic conception of the world, meaning is, is no longer something that, you know, that is possible beyond us. We're sort of grounded in our own finitude. We no longer seek the mysterious depths of things. There's no mystery. There's no sense of meaning being something beyond what we can classify, dissect, analyze, etc. So everything has sort of been, been closed back into this, you know, this, this imminent frame. We still have those same aspirations that our human ancestors have, but there's no longer any terminus for them. And I think that goes 
to, you know, this, because we're no longer seeking something, we're no longer open to something beyond us. Now we sort of close in and the world becomes smaller. The world becomes much more violent as we sort of translate this religious sense, this religious urge to finite objects. Hmm. That's very interesting. The, the last thing of what you mentioned, especially with the, um, the kind of amount of unrest that feels like there is in the, in the world right now, especially, um, here in the States. I don't know if you being in Australia currently are kind of in tune with that, uh, to any degree, but it, you know, it definitely yeah, feels well, like there's something yeah, like that happening here. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, people don't lose this, you know, we're created for something more, let's say in, in a very basic sense. And that, that doesn't just go away when we, we say, I, I no longer believe in something beyond, beyond the world. Mm-hmm. So now the only difference is, you know, now I dedicate myself to finding meaning within this bounded frame that I've created. And of course, there is no there, no meaning there ultimately, short of a genuine opening of of infinity. And so it ends up being very destructive part of the time. It's, it's also fascinating to think about that in the context of Tolkien's own life, uh, living as he did and, and maybe the greatest period of, uh, of worldwide violence in all of human history, right? I mean... First World War One, which he he uh, was a young man during and 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 fought in, and then World War Two, um, and living through that, living through um, you know the air raids and and all that sort of thing. Um, he if 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 that if if that was indeed part of the modern age, which I I, I assume you would probably say it was, you know that's kind of the modern historical yeah. age. Um, it's it's fascinating to think about that being the most this incredibly violent period in history um, it, it is a manifestation of that phenomenon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, I mean, looking back at the 20th century, 20th century, I mean, it really was unbelievable in terms of, you know, ideologies and world conflicts. And, you know, it's, it's in some sense, you look back at it now and say, well, it's a miracle that we're, we're still here at all. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it really does. Uh, it really does seem like a miracle. I mean, I think you see that, you know, that, deep struggle between good and evil you see that come out in in tolkien's you know, middle earth yeah i mean it really is a, a battle to to the end as it were and you know they we they, they get very close to the end and the destruction of everything in the lord of the rings so i'm sure all of you know tolkien's own experience of the 20th century is somehow feeding into that absolutely well and so we we talked about this word in disenchantment and you know you're one of the sections in this chapter one is actually enchantment to disenchantment. And it strikes me, and I don't know if you did this intentionally, but enchantment is actually a very important idea for, for Tolkien. Um, mm. He talks about it in, on fairy stories and, right. um, and what he means by enchantment. He basically says the role of the role of a good fairy story. And, you know, you probably are aware that he doesn't mean like, you know, a little fairy tale. He means like kind of the epic, what he basically means what Lord of the Rings is. Right. Yeah, and, sure. um, the, the role of a story like that is to enchant, right. It's not to, mm-hmm. um, it's not to cause this like suspension of disbelief or something like that, which is more maybe mm-hmm. a, um, maybe a modern idea, but yeah, it's, it's mm-hmm. actually to so allow someone to so immerse themselves in this work that they, it, it seems to become real for them and it becomes a, a way to escape, right? Um, the kind of existential prison in which we can sometimes find ourselves, yeah, you know? Um, so it, that just strikes me as a very uh, powerful idea, this enchant that we're going from this enchantment to disenchantment. And once we lose the ability to be enchanted, maybe what do we have left? You know, it's, it's a very perilous place right. to be. Exactly. I mean, we end up with this hollowed out sort of, you know, technological re- reason, that you know, it's basically about making and doing as opposed to contemplating a mystery that transcend us, transcends us. And again, I think you see that that aspect of a critique of, critique of modernity in Tolkien as well. I mean, you, this this notion of the machine and mm-hmm. magic and force, all of these things that are very much marks of the the modern mind's attempt to to create reality, to make reality. And I think there's a commentary in the Lord of the Rings about that as well. You know, we see that in in Sauron's d- destruction of the the trees when he's um, sort of turned to the dark side, as it were. Yeah. And there's sort of a there's a lot of sort of little little subplots in a way going on in all kinds of little corners of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, that's in, and indeed that's one of the most en- enchanting aspects of it is um, is that the verisim- verisimilitude that that all that all creates. Um, 
you know, it it kind of it kind of strikes me, um, and and I'm going to take it a little bit of a, a direction I wasn't expecting it to go for a brief moment because I think this is appropriate yeah. to what we've been talking about. Um, the the day that um, lot in in June of this year when the when the riots uh, or the the protest and and then in some cases uh, riots along with that began was a Saturday here in the states. I don't have the exact date in front of me, um, but. What's interesting to me about that is it also happened to be the day because I remember watching the SpaceX rocket take off um, that same day, and it was the first day that America. It, it was the first time Americans had had gone to space from American soil in like uh, in, since like 2011 or something like that. Yeah. And it also yeah. was this idea of that it's this first step in this big new push to go to the moon and then beyond, right? And right. um, and it's just striking to me that there was this incredibly maybe optimistic event <laughs> happening that day. And then a very, right. Right. a very pessimistic series of events that were, you know, a, a, certainly a reaction to some, uh, to, a, to a very real and grievous injustice mm. um, yeah. and uh, you know, going on. So, but again, it strikes me that you kind of have this tension of, you know uh, that, and, it, and something that's poten- potentially very enchanting on one level, but then a yeah. lot of disenchantment in manifesting itself and maybe uh, this, yeah. 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 And it, I mean, I think it, it's a, that, that's a good example in, in terms of the, you know, showing up in many respects, the contradictions inherent in our sort of modern secular world. On the one hand, we do technology really well. I mean, scarily well, let's yeah. be honest. <laughs> but, but now we seem to be at a point in our civilization where we don't do human things so well anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've got deep human problems that we can't seem to figure out and they just tend to sort of, end up becoming these these downward spirals of, of, of violence and, and all kinds of things. So we've got, you know, the technological thing. I mean, obviously the two are two are related in some way, um, but we've sort of forgotten how to be to be human within it. So there's this real loss of, I mean, let's let's face it, there's this loss of what what ultimately and really truly matters. Yeah. And technology is great. I mean, I wouldn't want to go back to, to before technology, but by the same token, if, it, if, if through it we forget our humanity, if we're no longer capable of being human, then, you know, what's the point? Well, we, cer- we certainly wouldn't be having this interview if we didn't have the technology. No, that's <laughs> so, right, exactly. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, let's jump ahead because we've been, uh, you know, we, let's, let's jump ahead and maybe, we've, we've been talking, I think, a lot about the problem that you diagnose and with this book. And I want to move to the the solution, the remedy that you that you uh, point to. So in chapter four, there's this section called uh, "Rediscovering Faith on Mount Doom." Um, Mount Doom seems like an awful, strange place to rediscover faith. <laughs> it's like, um, it, you know, it, 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 maybe when the eagles come, after, you know, and, and 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 rescue them, maybe maybe then there's the ability to discover rediscover faith. But uh, yeah, there's a really so much at the end there. Yeah, yeah. So so what what is this idea? Like, how do we do, how do we how do we in our world rediscover faith on Mount Doom? Yeah, I mean, that is sort of the the question, really, that the book is, is trying to address. I mean, we find ourselves in a difficult situation. Uh, many people find themselves with their, you know, fundamental questions about the faith that they've professed for, you know, maybe many years. And there's so much complexity in our life. There's so many things that undermine our faith. Um, so how do we get ourselves to the point where we can actually re, re- rediscover it in a, in a, in a way that's that's meaningful for for my being and my my living. Um, so really, I, you, I reach a point of the book where I say, look, we've looked at all of this history, we've looked at all of these difficult and challenging ideas, and now we reach the point where you sort of have to decide, you know, what 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 do I make of all of this? Mm-hmm. So it's at that point that I sort of jump back into the literary world of of the Lord of the Rings, and I sort of you know, put the reader. In the, in the position of this, this hobbit who has been through this, you know, this perilous journey and now stands, you know, literally ring in hand, mm-hmm. um, with this momentous decision that's going to, you know, determine, um, you know, their life from that point on. So either you throw the ring into the fire, you, you make the right choice, you choose all that is good, true and beautiful, everything that the, that the fellowship of the ring has, has, has been working towards, or you claim the ring for yourself, you turn your back on this, you know, this deeper mystery, this deeper truth, and you go the way of, of Gollum. Mm-hmm. Um, so ultimately, I sort of, you know, I, I draw attention to, you know, the paradox in, um, 
Frodo's ultimate inability to actually throw the ring into the fire by himself. So he actually says, now nah, I'm going to be this little, this little hobbit lord and I'm going to rule the world, as, as, as pathetic as that, that ultimately is. <laughs> I mean, no, really, he's just going to become like another Gollum. Right. Um, but then, of course, we see this, this moment where he's then attacked by, by Gollum. Gollum, as it were, saves the day as you know, perhaps Gandalf could, could, have, could, have, could have foreseen. You never quite know what's going to happen in, in the odd twists and turns of history. And it's at that point that you know, I sort of then jump into the, the, the Christian understanding that ultimately we can't do anything of this on our own. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're lost without the intervention, intervention of, of grace in our life. So ultimately we can't throw that ring of power and destruction into the fire without Christ. But when Christ does in fact enter into our life, we attach ourselves to him, we share in his death and resurrection, then actually we can make that, that momentous choice. We can actually at that point abide the long defeat, live in hope, live in grace towards an ultimate um, victory in Christ. Um, and so that for me, I hope, was the moment in which then I start to get into you know, the more theological parts of the book at that Point, the, the sort of the theological kernel of Christian faith, which I say that, you know, if you're going to evangelize others, well, this is sort of what you have to encounter and experience yourself. Mm-hmm. This is the, the ground of, of, of an authentic act of, uh, of the evangelical um, witness. So it's at that point I sort of build up the anthropology, if you will, and then the final chapters deal with um, how you then might share that, that with the world. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and, and I was very struck, you know, that the the um, episode of Frodo's failure is a very uh, is a very striking moment in the work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I have a hard time thinking that any anybody who reads it for the first time, you know, doesn't isn't shocked by that, right? Yeah. Um, right. Exactly. But but at the same time, there's a greater power at work, a mysterious power yeah. at work that yeah. still brings him through it despite his failure and, and right. still accomplishes. So, so he gets credit for how far he came Yeah, and, yeah. and that was really what he needed to do, but it, it like yeah. wasn't even his thing to make the final, ultimately it was Absolutely. not his thing to make the final decision. Absolutely. So when it, you know, when you come right down to it, he's not a, he's not a conventional hero who sort of wins the day by his strength and virtue and character. I mean, he's, he's just as flawed as, as everyone else. I mean, yes, he's able to do great things. And again, that's the whole notion of the, this Hobbit thing, that somehow um, you know, they, can, they can do things that the great, the conventional great can't do. But even when you get to it, get right, right down to it, even the distinctive virtues that seem to belong to Hobbits, even that's not enough to win the day. Mm-hmm. There has to be some other intervention. And so there's all kinds of sort of layers of, of lessons here in terms of what heroic action looks like, what virtue looks like. And ultimately, I mean, you, I think you do see strongly this notion of, of grace or perhaps better providence coming through sort of in, at least in this, certainly in this final scene where, um, you know, it's only this, you know, it's Gollum that sort of ends up being a kind of hero in the right. end, not, not a hero, obviously, but instrumental, instrumental in sort of bringing yeah. this, you know, this this goal of providence if you will um to fruition yeah yeah um and of course you know sam has his role to play as well um and and just getting the fact that frodo gets there in the first place um that's right gets all the way that's there. right in a certain sense you know i mean obviously frodo's bearing this this really heavy burden but you know there's real there's real sort of redeeming virtue you could say in sam mm-hmm. um and i think that comes through very strongly in in that character absolutely um so, um, I, I've, I've heard this saying before, and I was hoping I, I, this, this idea that the medium is the message. Hmm. Um, how does, so, and I don't know that you necessarily talk about this specifically in the book, but my question for you is, because I think there's so a lot of, I think there's something to be said here. How does Tolkien realize this idea effectively with his, with his works? How does Tolkien realize the idea that the medium is the message in his in his own works? Yeah, I think the I mean I think the obvious place to look at is this whole notion of the ring. Um, and you know, people, you know, various characters in the Lord of the Rings, they they look at this ring and think, 
well, you know, yes, it's it's bad. It was created by Sauron. It's got this power in it, but ultimately, I think I can I can I can take it. I can yeah. stand it. I'll be I'll be different than the next guy. And mm. so, obviously, Boromir sees it as sees it as a great weapon of war. He who wields the the ring will be essentially invincible. And of course, he's doing it for the good. I mean, he, he's a good guy. He's on the right side. Um, and so there's this constant sort of un- underestimating of the corruptive influence of the ring, that actually the one who wields it ends up giving their freedom and agency over to the ring, even against their, their best intentions. So well, somehow that, that medium of the ring sort of captures your thinking, your, your doing, your whole intentionality and sours and distorts it. So if you, if you eat bad food, well, you're going to be unhealthy. Um, you become what you eat, as it were. And so this notion that the practices that you participate in actually form and shape you as a person. And if you participate in bad practices, there's going to be a bad outcome. If you participate in good practices, by contrast, there's going to be a good outcome. So I think with this notion of the ring, Tolkien really does capture a sense of, you know, this notion of the medium is the message, that somehow the message is always shaped and constrained and influenced by sort of what we're doing at a, at a bodily level, the people that we're with, the things that we're doing, all of this sort of shapes us as human persons. And so I think um, there is this, this contrast between two different cultures, if you will, going on in Tolkien, this, this culture of life versus this culture of death and life, this notion of, you know, the fellowship that's actually going to guide and support and carry you through life's challenges in a, in a good way, leading you to true goodness, truth, and beauty. Um, whereas participating in a culture of death, I mean, that's ultimately going to destroy all of your best motivations and desires and, and sort of shape you in the, in the image of evil. And so again, this contrast between light and darkness, good and evil, um, I think, you know, Tolkien's understanding of the ring really brings out strongly that whole dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, the uh, as we talk about that, I, the the medium is the message. Um, I had two thoughts. First was a theological thought in the sense that uh, the incarnation, the doctrine of the incarnation, is like the ultimate uh, ultimate idea of the medium is the message, right? Christ, like yeah, Christ, God right. becomes us, right? Becomes one of us exactly. to exactly. to, to and manifest his salvation, right? To manifest his his redemption. Um, and then the second thought was. Um, was the idea of hot going back to Tolkien, the idea, just the idea of hobbitness, right. Uh, as being a remedy, um, that for our present situation of, of trying to live a life that maybe is not perfectly aloof from the lure of the ring, uh, it yeah. is not perfectly, um, detached from it possibly getting hold of us, but, but is nevertheless, less more immune maybe and it's and what it is right and and yeah, and, and it's right. essential character um yeah basically yeah you know. yeah and i think there's a lesson there about how we really you know if we, if we really take you know if we're looking for an alternative as it were to the kinds of things we see in the in the secular world i mean we really do need to unhook ourselves from our participation in those in the practices of that of that culture that anti-culture and so there really does have to be a deliberate separation from you know simply blindly participating in anything that's sort of mainstream as it were Mm -hmm. and and again it's about retraining our bodily and and desiring patterns and to do that you have to sort of enter into a new culture you need to find new friends a new fellowship if you will will, if you want to sort of uh, build yourself up in a different way interesting um so um you do talk about at one point, and, and um, we talk about baptism. You, you speak of baptism quite a bit as a as a remedy for um, you know for our our modern contemporary predicament. And of course, yep. that's that's the remedy that Christianity has been all about from the very beginning. Uh, but Absolutely. could you talk more about like because I mean, for somebody who's not a Christian, that could seem like the oddest thing. Like, how, okay, I, I agree with you on like your diagnosis of the problem that we face. Uh, the existential reality of the world we live in right now, but I don't see how baptism is a remedy for that. Yeah, well, basically there, I mean, baptism is the is the beating heart of Christian faith. I mean, it's not entry into 
to a new idea, a different philosophy. It's actually entering into an, an embodied form of life, a sacramental community. It's a an entry into Christ's death and resurrection, a participation in, in his death and resurrection. It's, it's an attachment that that um, is sort of real in, in a way that that is something more than simply just just thinking. So, mm -hmm. so I use this basically as an image to contrast, you know, our allegiance to the world versus our allegiance to to, to Christ. And, and baptism is again this this notion of an embodied point of contact, something that goes beyond simply the the intellectual or the cerebral, that in fact can ground and enter the self, um, ground the self in a new form of being, a new set of practices. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that for me is like I say, that's the the essence of the faith: this encounter with a person that is more than simply an encounter with someone in the street. It's more than simply an encounter with a friend. It's actually this this new way of being, this new life, this new creation. Mm -hmm. So, all of the the, the 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 classic understandings of baptism sort of enter into enter into this understanding. And my point really is: well, this is this is what animated Christianity right from its its very beginnings. And I think this is something that we have to deeply. Um, deeply remember and deeply bring back to life if we're going to have any any hope of, of combating the the anti-culture of our current secular world mm -hmm. rebaptize baptism <laughs> yeah and then that's kind of what kind of what it is i mean yeah. it's, we're at a point now where you know god for all practical intents and purposes in our culture god is dead as nietzsche put it I mean, so yeah. how do you go back from the death of god i mean it's not so much about about thinking or rather you know if we want to think the right way we first of all have to have this attachment of love this real relationship with something that transcends us. so here i really am, am on about the primacy of grace that ultimately we can't really get ourselves out of our mess whatever that mess may be my personal mess our cultural mess we really have to rely on you know, grace given as a gift which sort of lights a spark in us gives faith to us and it's at that point that we can then start to pick up the pieces so we, we find ourselves in this long defeat. I mean, that, that's inescapable, you know, and I think really that's this true story of, of human existence, um, whether it be on an individual level or whether it be on a societal and entire all of civilization, all throughout human history. There's this sense of, yes, we are, we're, we're, we're living in this long defeat. And so is it a long defeat that ends in despair and complete end, or is it a defeat, is it a long defeat that with the glimmer of hope that we don't really completely understand what that is all about, but we sense that it's there. And, mm -hmm. and like, yeah. this is like, to me, this is what Tolkien is all about, right? Like he, yeah. right. this is why I have now, <laughs> I have done over 200 episodes of a podcast on Tolkien. And, yeah, you know, right. it's, it's right. because of this idea. It's giving, right? It does, you know, and, and, um, and you, you discover this anew in so many different ways in his writing. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's clear that he was utterly convinced of this. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I wanted to just conclude uh, with a quote from your conclusion here. The burden of Tolkien's literary vision is thus to show how the limits of the horizon of temporality and time are surpassed by something far greater. It is this that places existence under the sign of the theological virtue of hope. Violence and despair, no matter how pervasive in this world, carry no power for the one who lives in hope, for the one who has allowed his or her being to be rewoven by the infinite grace of adoption. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, those are really powerful words. And, and I think you're saying there what I, <laughs> what I had just said, and, uh, not quite as eloquently, um, that, you know, do you, any, do you want to say anything more about that particular passage? Yeah. I mean, that kind of, that kind of sums up, um, sums up what I was, what I was aiming to accomplish, I hope in that book. And it really is this, you know, there is, you know, large parts of the book, there is this sort of stark contrast between the way of, of death and despair and violence and the way of life, light and hope, if you will. And so we pass through some dark mines, we climb some, you know, some pretty serious mountains. And ultimately, I hope we we end up in a recognition that that ultimately, um, you know, there's a there's a grace there's a hope given to us if we if we are able to sort of um, receive it, like the hobbits, if we're able to sort of um, grow into what we're called to be, that in fact can see us through the, the darkest times of life. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I wrote most of this book 
during a period of um, closure of the institute that I was was a part of. Hmm. So I, mean, I think, in, in a way, the book is sort of autobiographical in regards to some of the experiences I was going through during our you know our, our long defeat as a hmm. faculty at the institute. I mean, the institute meant a lot lot to me over the years, and so going through that, I mean, I look back at the book now and I say, I mean, there were some real real challenges associated with that whole situation. There was some real grieving that went on. Um, and ultimately you hope that, you know, there's a grace and a hope that is given paradoxically even within the the suffering that, that comes comes in there. And so I hope something like that can be offered to, to anyone who picks up the book. I mean, I don't offer easy answers because there's yeah. not easy answers to difficult problems. I mean, and really, you know, a life of, a life of, of God's grace is simply about so in one sense, giving the grace just to to suffer well and get through things. Yeah. And sometimes there's a lot there's a lot better given, and ultimately there will be a lot better better given. Um, but I mean, just because you have grace doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily be easy. But again, there's this there's this hope, there's this guiding presence in your life, there's this experience of love that is possible for the one who gives himself over to truth and goodness and beauty that for, for me are, are represented perfectly in Jesus Christ. So hopefully if I kind of given some sort of vision of that in the book, um, you know, that, 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 that to me will be an indicator of the book's success. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah. You, you're talking about uh, the, the mines we might have to travel through the mountains. We might have to climb. I'm good with all of that. Just as long as I don't have to deal with the giant spider. I'm, you know, I can, yeah, I can deal true. with the rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some things you can't deal with, right? <laughs> that's right. There's some things, you know, just like, Lord have mercy. All right. Um, <laughs> no, it, it really, um, it, great stuff. Um, I think um, you're exactly right. Like the, the idea, the, the Christian, way is not about making it easier right it's not about yeah. oh, it's not about the easy life it's about um it's about the reality of this life but it's about a traversing it with in communion with god and union with god and b um the hope right the hope that that the god that we follow gives us right um yeah, absolutely. yeah so wonderful well connor um this has been great. Thank you so much for the time that you've given for this interview. And, um, thank you so much for the book, um, you know, for giving the world this book too. Uh, once again, to our listeners, it's called abiding the long defeat, how to evangelize like a hobbit in a disenchanted age. Um, and I will have links to where it's available in the show notes. Um, and Connor, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, y'all. Well, thanks for listening to that interview with Connor Sweeney. So we've got a little bit of uh, just brief correspondence we want to share. Uh, you know, we've it's kind of been backlogging because we were gone, we were off the air for two weeks, and uh, but these are gonna I'm gonna keep it pretty short because uh, uh, Greta. Here's the truth: Greta had to work last night, so <laughs> she's a little tired. She's a little tired, y'all. Yeah, so, I'm for you in tonight. So you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go into some of the deeper stuff and have her like, you know, just fly off the handle and say something really rude, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best to hold it together right now. I'm, so I'm just tread to, lightly. I'm trying to protect you guys from the uh, from the wrath wrath of the tired. That's crazy. Tired do, do men feel like? super emotional too when they're like overtired or is that just a woman thing i don't know oh totally like when at the end of the day um like end of most days i've learned with myself over time hey pro tip for you all when you get to the end of a day or like later on in a day and you start feeling down about like the work you're doing or um the diff like you know just like whatever it is and being like oh, the stuff i'm doing is not making the progress that i wanted to have I've learned that that's a sign that you just need to stop working. Just stop working. And take it easy. Maybe have a drink. That you worked hard. Go to bed early. And you had a good day. And now it's time your your mind, your psychology, your body, all of that is telling you that it's time to chill. Just chill. Just relax. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we're going to keep this short. That's right. So I can go chill. That's right. Well, I wanted to just, uh, I think these are all pretty positive things. So I think this is going to be a nice little nice Okay, little good. Boost. Good. So, all right, Greta's like, do it. Stop blabbing. Enough already. Just get to the point. All right. So our first note, I'm actually going to say, I'm going to save this one because it's a little longer. I, I don't want to do any that are long on this episode because I want to, I want to get yeah, some time Yeah, you're using me as a scapegoat. It. It's fine. It's fine. 
no, I'm ready. To, I'll, I'll do them if you want to do them. Mm-hmm. No. I'm fine being used as the scapegoat today because I do need a little bit more sleep, please. I'm just saying, if you're gonna call, if you're gonna blame it on me, then. All right, let's see here. So, uh, all right, this note is from. Oh, I'm gonna save that. That's actually a little more deeper, so I'm gonna save that. That's a short one, but I'm gonna save it. All right, so we, we're basically down to two. All right, <laughs> recent iTunes review. Nice thing to say. Uh, let's see here. This says it's from Jay Dennis via Apple Podcasts. Five stars. Great resource. The discussion has really helped me to track through the events and scenes of the Silmarillion. Booyah. Yay. Thanks, Jay. I was going to say Dennis, but then I realized I don't think that's his first name. Or maybe it's his middle name. Anyway, thank you, Jay Dennis. Well, we don't know that it's not a a female. Oh, you're right. Because I take it Dennis is the last name. Oh, yeah. Dennis is the last name. Thank you, Jay. To say thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. And thank you for the five stars. Yes. I love yes, seeing five indeed. stars. All right. And then the final piece of correspondence. I mean, I don't feel too bad about not doing much correspondence today because it was a pretty long interview with Connor. So, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So the final one, Greta's like, shut up and just read it. <laughs> All right. You know, I love you guys and I'm happy to be here. I'm not trying to like make this sound not important because it is. So this one is from Matt L., he says, John and Greta, I've only just come across the Tolkien Road thanks thanks to your friends at Pints with Jack. Having been a huge Lord of the Rings fan since I was a kid, sadly, I've only made my way through the books once over Audible. However, after sampling a few of your episodes, I'm very excited to now begin a much-needed deep dive through the series again, starting with The Hobbit. By the end, I hope to cap it off with The Silmarillion. Hearing what you've been able to share behind the man that brought us so much uh, so much wonder through these legendary stories is also giving me a much greater appreciation for them as well. Thank you for what you have created here. And again, I'm very excited to revisit another journey through middle earth with you as my guides. Hope this shout out finds you well and encouraged. Ooh, that's awesome. Awesome note. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, thank Matt. You, thank you. We appreciate you. And, uh, and you just appreciate you sending some kind words our way. Yes. We do like those kind words. All right, you guys. Thanks for listening. And uh, Greta, you go get some. You go. You go take it easy. Go. I think I'm gonna go chill. You go just for chill for a little bit. That's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Everybody send good vibes Greta's way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not that bad off. I'm just a little sleepy. Yeah. And it's okay because yeah, I was up all night. night last night. Yeah. So I wish I was Superwoman. Yeah. But you know, we all have our limitations. So, anyway. I'll just channel me some Gandalf and Eowyn and Galadriel at work tonight, and I'll be good. Right on. All right. Right on, right on. Hey, on the uh, next, we're, we're going to be shifting in on the next episode to a walk through the history of Middle Earth, um, where we're going to go through the history of the Third Age. So, oh. really excited about that. I've been kind of working on outlining what we're going to be doing there, and uh, man, there's a lot of really fascinating stuff to talk about there. So, what that is, just FYI, it's everything leading up to The Hobbit. So, basically, 2,900 years of history to talk so about. So it's post Numenor. It's post Numenor. It's post Second Age, but it's before the Hobbit. So, you know, it's like I mean, it's literally almost 3000 years of of timeline to talk Where about. Where are we what are we uh using as our resource for that? Uh primarily the appendix uh, appendix B of Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay. But we'll go into other things as well. Okay. So That sounds fantastic. Yeah. All Should right. Be very cool. And uh span several episodes, so that's exciting. That is exciting. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks to our patrons. You all rock, especially the $5 or more patrons. Daniel P. David B. Chuck F. Ish of the Hammer. Chris L. James L. Zeke F. James A. Emilio P. Shannon S. Teresa C. Asia V. Brian O. And Jonathan D. Thanks, you guys. We appreciate you. Thank you, guys. You're the best. And we... Thanks for listening. We will talk at you next time. Yes, we will. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all.